learn better church history so we can appreciate better the Protestant Reformation of 500 years ago. Uh, thank you, Lord, for a vibrant week this week at Vacation Bible School. And I just pray you'll be with our Sunday school class and the worship service that follows. I ask that we would leave here change people uh, because of your eternal word. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Turn up the volume. Let's see. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, if you can't hear me, maybe that's an answer to prayer. <laughs> well, let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 8. Uh, if you need a handout, just put your hand up, and Ron will give you one. We started uh, last week a study on the uh, Protestant Reformation. And the reason we're looking into this is because you're going to start hearing a lot about it uh, this fall because uh, October 31st will mark the 500th year anniversary uh, of the Protestant Reformation. So most uh, evangelical Christians kind of look at that as some uh, odd event in history, and they kind of look back on it, and they don't really understand uh, its significance. So throughout these summer months, we're doing a Sunday school class explaining the significance of the Protestant Reformation, uh, because it's unlikely we would be sitting here today in the manner in which we're sitting here and studying had it not been for uh, a move of God uh, 500 years ago in what's called the Protestant Reformation. So it's hard to understand the Protestant Reformation unless you understand what the early church handed off or what the apostles rather handed off to the early church. And unless we also understand what subsequent generation of Christians lost. Until that is understood, you can't really understand the need to recover anything. So we are actually starting at the very beginning in our eight-part outline, uh, systematically talking about this to get a better appreciation uh, of the Protestant Reformation. So we're not actually getting into, for the first couple of lessons, the actual Reformation. What we're trying to establish is the need for the Protestant Reformation. So last time, you'll recall, we started with Roman numeral one in our eight-part outline, entitled The Early Church. Uh, the apostles, as I tried to demonstrate, interpreted the Bible, Old Testament, literally, including the subject of Bible prophecy. And that's what they, that's the baton that they handed off to the first Christians. The mindset of the first Christians is represented by that circle up north in a place called Antioch. A school started there. Uh, last time I tried to draw attention to the fact that that's where Paul launched his first missionary journeys from, Antioch. And it's also the place where the early church was called Christians for the first time. And it's also the place where the early church began to proliferate numerically. And you see that in Acts 11, uh, around verse 25. And the school of Antioch, as we tried to explain, and I gave you many, many uh, citations, some from scholars, some from actual church fathers. Uh, they interpreted the Bible, including Bible prophecy, literally. So I'm going to work hard at not repeating what I said last week unless I run into something new. And in my private reading this week, I ran into this citation from Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus, as you can see from the screen, lived uh, at the, you know, the second century, 
A.D. 125 to 202, roughly, was his lifespan. And there is a direct link between Irenaeus and John the Apostle. So here's the way the link works. Irena uh, John the Apostle discipled a man named Polycarp. Polycarp, in turn, discipled a man named Irenaeus. So Irenaeus is one generation removed from the apostles. So I like to, you guys remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials? Do they still run those? When E.F. Hutton talks, people what? Listen. So when Irenaeus talks, we should listen. Because Irenaeus is, there's a direct chain that can be established through Polycarp back to John. So the beliefs of Irenaeus uh, largely represent the beliefs of the apostles. And this was the mindset of the school of Antioch. And this is the mindset that dominated the early church for its first two centuries. And the quote I found in uh, George Peter's book, The Theocratic Kingdom, Peter says, the literal grammatical interpretation of the scriptures must be observed in order to obtain a correct understanding. The primitive church, uh, that would be the church following the apostles, the primitive church occupied this position and Irenaeus gives us the general sentiment when he says of the Holy Scriptures, now here's the quote from Irenaeus, that, with the, that what the understanding can daily make use of what it can easily know is that which lies before our eyes unambiguously, and notice this next word, literally and clearly in Holy Writ. So Irenaeus and the school of Antioch, having a tradition handed down to them from the apostles, uh, which is the mindset that dominated the church for its first two centuries after the apostles left the scene, was all about literal interpretation. Uh, you'll notice in Irenaeus's quote, literally. So they interpreted the best they could, the whole Bible literally, including Bible prophecy. And this is what made them all believe to a man that the kingdom was not something that they were in now. Uh, how could you interpret the Bible literally and believe we're in the kingdom now? That makes no sense. Uh, the kingdom, according to Isaiah's prophecies and others, is a time period when the nations will beat their swords into plowshares. And it's a time period when the Dead Sea will come back to life, biologically, Ezekiel 47. It's a time period when the city of Jerusalem is going to be the head of the nations again, etc. There's no way you can interpret those prophecies literally and believe we're in the kingdom. So because these men had such a great respect for the Bible, they took a literal approach to the whole Bible, including Bible prophecy, which made them what we call premillennialists, which is basically the belief that Jesus comes back first and then the kingdom follows. Uh, they didn't call themselves premillennialists. They called themselves what? Anybody remember? Starts with a C. Uh, Kiliasts coming from the Greek word kilia, which means a thousand. So you can add the Irenaeus quote to the other quotes I gave you last week concerning the general sentiment of the early uh, church. So things are rolling along pretty good for about two centuries, and then something happens. Unless you understand what happened, you can't really appreciate the Protestant Reformation. What happened is what I like to call the um, Alexandrian Eclipse. And as you look at this map again and you go down to the bottom circle down south, you'll see it's circled there, uh, Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt is a rival school that was established in Christianity. It was a school that rivaled the school of Antioch, which took the Bible, including Bible prophecy, literally. Uh, here's another map, if you like this map better. You see those two circles. And unless you understand those two circles, you can't really understand the Protestant Reformation. Because the Protestant Reformation is basically trying to get back to Antioch, 
Why did they need to get back to Antioch? Because of everything that was lost, thanks to the influence of Alexandria, Egypt, in North Africa. And Alexandria, Egypt, introduced a method of interpreting the Bible called allegorization. And we talked about that briefly, did we not, last time? Allegorization basically says what the text says is really not what's important. Now, that's not what they were teaching in Antioch, but this is what they began to teach in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And this didn't just start with Christianity. It actually started with early Judaism, or, or latter Judaism, I should say, just before the time of Christ, through a man named Philo. And Philo took a look at the rivers that are described in the Garden of Eden, the Pishon and the Gahan and the Euphrates and the Tigris, and he began to say things like, well, those aren't actual rivers. Those just represent four parts of the soul. So he's using the uh, text to bring in a higher spiritual meaning. And did I not take you last time through Nehemiah 3? And I showed you how the various gates, like the fish gate, the horse gate, uh, in Alexandrian mindset is allegorized away. And some kind of spiritual significance is attached to each gate. So that's another example of allegorization. The, the point that the allegorist would say is not to describe a city wall with gates around it. I mean, that's boring anyway. Who wants to hear that? What you need is the higher meaning. And so they began to attach some kind of spiritual significance to each gate. That's a process of interpretation uh, called allegorization. So, very quickly, let me explain why allegorization is a wrong method of interpretation and why we at Sugarland Bible Church do not embrace the allegorical method of interpretation. I found these four reasons in Dr. Pentecost's classic book, Things to Come, pages 405, uh, 425 rather. He defines allegorization and he gives four reasons why it's wrong. So here they are very quickly. Number one, when you allegorize, the text itself is not being uh, interpreted. What's happening is you're bringing a bunch of ideas to the text that aren't found in the text. Uh, so Milton Terry wrote a classic book on hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, as you might know, is the science an art of biblical interpretation. And Terry rightly criticizes allegorization, and he says it will be noticed at once that its habit, that's allegorization, is to disregard the common signification of words and give wing to all manner of fanciful speculation. It does not draw out the legitimate meaning of an author's language but foists into it whatever the whim or fancy of an interpreter may desire. So when you get under allegorical teaching, uh, you might hear occasionally something that's spiritually true, but you look at the text that this is supposedly drawn from, and the ideas don't naturally come out of the text. And there's a big difference, and you need to learn these two words. There's a big difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis comes from the Greek preposition ek, which means out of. So an exegete is someone who is drawing from the text what the text says, which is what you want, right, in a Bible study, because we believe God has spoken. Eisegesis is the exact opposite. Eisegesis comes from the Greek preposition eis, E-I-S, which means into. And an eisegesis is reading into the passage things that aren't there. So obviously of the two, what, what should we, we prefer, exegesis or eisegesis? Well, since God has revealed himself in this book, and God is the authority, right? Who do I think I am to rewrite or edit God? 
So the practice that we follow in Bible study and in sermons and so forth is not eisegesis. That's what they were doing in Alexandria, Egypt. But exegesis, which is what the school of Antioch represented and what the church of Jesus Christ role modeled for its first two centuries. Here's a little uh, saying that may help you um, uh, kind of uh, internalize this. Uh, it says, I'm not sure who I got this from, but I like it. I don't think it's original with me. But it says, he or she who spiritualizes, now spiritualize is another way of saying allegorization. He or she who spiritualizes tells spiritual lies. Because they're making the Bible say a bunch of things that, that that particular passage is not saying. And uh, you have to understand that, that when you're under an allegorist, you're under a perpetual liar. Uh, someone who's making the Bible say something it's not actually saying. So allegorization becomes a dangerous practice. The text itself is not being interpreted. The second danger of allegorization is there's a shift in authority from the text to the mind of the interpreter. What's important is not what the text says. What's important is what comes out of the mind of the interpreter of the text under allegorization. So Jerome, who actually practiced allegorization himself, as I'll show you a little bit later, actually made this correct statement. He says, once we start with the rule that whole passages and books of Scripture say one thing when they actually mean another, the reader is delivered, uh, bound hand and foot to the caprice of the interpreter. So if I was an allegorist, the authority in this church would be me and not what the Bible says. And so what's happened in Bible interpretation is authority shifts from the, the passage to the mind of the interpreter, which is a dangerous practice because God has spoken. And who is man to edit God? Number three, there is no way to test the interpreter once you get under allegorization. Because allegorization is a highly uh, subjective practice. So you might remember last week as we were going around the walls here of the city of Jerusalem, we came to the horse gate. And many allegorists would say, well, the horse gate represents the controlling the tongue because James 3 talks about a bit placed in a horse's mouth in reference to the tongue. Well, I look at an interpretation like that and I say, well, who says? I think the horse gate could refer to the second coming of Christ. Because Jesus Christ is coming back on a what? A white horse. So which allegorist is right? And the reality of the situation is there's no way to, to test which one is right. Because you can uh, assign multiple allegories to anything you want it to mean. So one allegorist says one thing, another allegorist says something else. And the nice thing about being an allegorist is you can never lose your job because you're the only one that knows what the allegory means. So it becomes a highly subjective uh, practice. And then the fourth problem with allegorization is there isn't any mechanism. You lose control of interpretation because there's no mechanism for controlling the interpreter's imagination. So a lot of Christians follow the practice of the sanctified imagination, you know, when they interpret the Bible, and they come up with wild interpretations and you look at the passage that they're supposedly using, and it's not based in the passage. It comes from their own minds. And essentially, when you move into allegorization, what starts to control is whatever just emanated out of the allegorist's carnal mind. So Bernard Ram wrote a very important book on hermeneutics called... Uh, Protestant biblical interpretation, and he makes this statement. He says, to state the principle meaning of the Bible is a second sense meaning, and that the principal method of interpretation is spiritualizing, is to open the door 
to almost uncontrolled speculation and imagination. For this reason, we have insisted that the control in interpretation is the literal method. I would add to it the literal method consistently applied. In other words, you interpret words or phrases in the Bible according to the ordinary sense of those words and phrases. And uh, that's a, a practice that requires a lot of discipline. Uh, that's, a, that's a practice that's somewhat difficult. Um, it requires some training to do it, but, but you can do it. Uh, I can do it. And what's happening when you're following the literal approach is uh, the speculation and imagination of the interpreter is not in control. Uh, the biblical text is in control. So in Alexandria, Egypt, really starting with Philo, and then it sort of took off uh, as Christians migrated to Alexandria, Egypt, uh, following the first two centuries of the church, this practice took off called allegorization. And, you know, you might ask yourself, why in the world would the Church of Jesus Christ for about a thousand years abandon a practice of literal interpretation that can be clearly traced back to the apostles at Antioch? Why would they throw that out? And why would they substitute allegorization? And I don't mean to oversimplify things, but I think there's at least five reasons why the church discarded the time and tested teaching of Antioch and embraced this more exciting practice uh, down uh, south in Alexandria, Egypt. So here are the five reasons very quickly. Number one, <laughs> once you move into allegorization, your sermons and your teachings can be immediately relevant to the need of the listener. And what you have to understand is uh, people today have very small attention spans. And they don't want to come to church and have a guy stand up for half an hour, like I do, actually a little more than a half an hour, and explain the meaning of the passage. Your average uh, churchgoer today, you know, wants to treat the church kind of like, you know, Burger King. You know, we want it our way. And you better say something fast. You better make your point quick. And it better apply directly to my life. And uh, if I don't get what I need, I'll go down the, the street to another church that will do it the way I want it done. So there is a very short attention span in people related to church. We treat church like we would never treat anything. You would never treat your job that way. You would never treat your academic pursuits that way. But we treat church that way. And the preacher uh, oftentimes succumbs to the pressure and wants to be relevant. And so the fastest, need to, the fastest way to be relevant is you just become allegorical. I mean, after all, who wants to hear a boring sermon on the, the walls, the gates around the walls of the city of Jerusalem? It's more exciting to learn about evangelism, the Holy Spirit, and other things like that. So once you become allegorical, you can become relevant really fast. And it was Howard Hendricks at Dallas Seminary that put it this way, and I very much appreciated what he said. He said, anybody can be relevant if they don't care about being biblical. Conversely, anybody can be biblical if they don't care about being relevant. The, the discipline of preaching and teaching is to be both. It's to establish meaning and explain it to people, but then don't just leave them there. Explain why what you just developed actually relates to their lives. Uh, but many people uh, would rather just go fast into relevance, and so they become allegorical. And this was the appeal at the school of uh, Alexandria. Bernard Ram says, but citing verses in the Old Testament in themselves frequently very obscure, as if superior to verses in the New, revealed no new understanding of the significance of historical and progressive revelation for hermeneutics. They considered the Old and especially the New Testaments filled with parables, enigmas, and riddles. 
the allegorical method alone suffice to bring out the, the meaning, and you could put meaning there in quotes because they weren't really getting the meaning, of these parables, and enigmas, and riddles. So this is why verse-by-verse verse teaching through the Bible has taken such a hit because when you're going verse-by-verse, verse, you're going to be running into subjects like genealogies that God put there but, you know, your average person listens to a genealogy and they say, well, how does this relate to my life? So the temptation is to skip the genealogy or the temptation is to make the genealogy say something that it's not saying because of the very short attention span of the listener. Uh, a second reason the church went into allegorization is they started to merge human philosophy with Bible interpretation. And that's why I had you open up to the book of Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 8, where Paul warned against this. Paul said to the Colossians, see to it that no one takes you captive. Uh, the word captive is interesting. Once you move into human philosophy, you're now captive to that philosophy. Through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men it's a man-made teaching according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ once you move into human philosophy basically what happens is you move away from the full wisdom of Jesus Christ which is limitless into a teaching of a man and Paul says it's elementary so you exchange the majesty and the depths of the wisdom of Christ for some sort of elementary human philosophy. And Paul says it's like going back to kindergarten. You're going back and learning the ABCs all over again when you already know the alphabet. You already know how to write sentences. You know how to write paragraphs. You know how to write papers. You know how to write books. You have all of this wisdom in Christ and you're abandoning that and you're going back into the ABCs. That's what happens when you exchange the thinking of God for the thinking of man. And what happened at Alexandria, Egypt is these folks became very philosophical. Now, there are a lot of Christians today that are very philosophical. What I mean by that is they've bought into some kind of philosophy. And they try to merge the Bible with that philosophy. And when you try to merge the Bible with a human philosophy, what happens is um, the two separate at some point. So what do you do when your human philosophy separates from the Bible? Well, you just twist the Bible around through allegorization to make it fit your philosophy. And this is a practice that people do all of the time. They do it in Genesis 1 through 11. They've fallen in love with something Charles Darwin says. And they try to merge that philosophy with Genesis 1 through 11. And what's the end game? Genesis 1 through 11 starts saying something that it really doesn't say. Uh, where this is very big today is people fall in love with psychology, human psychology. Freud, Skinner, Young, you know, these types of beliefs, and they try to merge that with the Bible, and you make the Bible start saying something it, it really was never designed to say. How many people believe in human empowerment, that you can command things into existence through your words, and many people try to merge that with the Bible, and you come up with... Uh, the prosperity gospel or the prosperity movement and see that's why Paul is warning here about philosophy and to not let philosophy take over. Um, so Bernard Ram says the outstanding Jewish allegorist was Philo. He was thoroughly, he was a thoroughly convinced Jew. To him the scriptures primarily in the Septuagint version were superior to Plato and Greek philosophy yet he had a great fondness for Greek philosophy especially Plato and Pythagoras. By a most elaborate system of allegorizing he was able to reconcile for himself his loyalty to the Hebrew faith 
and at the same time, his love for Greek philosophy. So what he started to do, Philo, is he started to merge human philosophy with the scripture. And doggone it, the scripture is kind of stubborn. It's not submitting to my philosophy at certain points. I know what I'll do. I'll just allegorize that scripture. Uh, Ronald DePros, in a book I highly recommend to you, if, if you get, the, get this and read it, it'll explain a lot of these ideas. It's called Israel in the Development of Christian Thought. Ronald DePros says Clement of Alexandria was unashamedly a Christian Platonist. And as such, he quoted from Plato and he quoted from other philosophers with the same ease which he quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures in the New Testament. Moreover, he interpreted the Bible in light of Platonic concepts. So Platonic concepts becomes the grid through which Clement of Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt, began to read the scripture. His dependence upon Plato is further evident in a speculative passage in which the Jews are featured as helpers, while the Christians are considered fit to rule. So those Jewish people, you know, God doesn't have a future for them. The Jews are here to serve us Christians. And so he began to take certain uh, teachings in the Old Testament and allegorize them and make it sound like that's what the Bible is teaching. And that's really the origin of what you call place replacement theology. DePros goes on and he talks about another well-known allegorist that I'll call your attention to in a minute, a man named Origen. Origen continued with the Alexandrian t tradition of interpreting the Bible in a way that harmonized uh, with Greek philosophy. So whatever philosophy you're into, you better be very careful about that. Because uh, what's going to happen at some point is the tail's going to start wagging the dog. And uh, the, you're going to start t being tempted to make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. A third reason why the church shifted into allegorical interpretation was the influence of something called Gnostic dualism. Alexandria, Egypt, everything we know about it was a hotbed of Gnosticism. Uh, Gnostics taught a lot of different things, but one of the things that they talked about a lot was dualism. And they would say this, the physical world, the material world is bad. But the spiritual world is what? It's good. Now, once you, by the way, is that even biblical? Is the physical world bad? Look at what God said after the six-day week of creation. God saw all that he had made. Now, what would that be, all that he had made? Sunlight, uh, food procreation, sexuality, all that's described in Genesis 1. It's all physical things, right? God saw all that he had made, and behold, he doesn't just say it was good, he says it was what? Very good. So the physical world is not bad. The physical world has been marred by sin, but the physical world in and of itself is not inherently evil. The Gnostics taught that it was. Now, once that becomes your philosophy, it starts to wreak havoc on other doctrines of the Bible. One of the things it destroys is your Christology or your doctrine of Christ because the Gnostics would say, well, how could Jesus have come in a body, the incarnation, because the physical world is what? It's bad. So something developed in the early church called um, Sorinthianism, named after the heretic Sorinthus. And Sorinthus basically taught that Jesus was never the Christ or the Messiah. He was just a guy born into the world. Well, how did he become the Christ? Oh, Sorinthus said, you see, the spirit of Christ descended upon him. And that's how Sorinthus uh, interpreted the Holy Spirit descending like a dove in Christ's baptism. And the Spirit of Christ left Jesus just before his death. 
But Jesus was never the Christ. Jesus couldn't have been the Christ because how could Christ come in a body because the physical world is what? Bad. Once you understand that, you start understanding what in the world 1 John is talking about. A lot of people try to read 1 John without this background and some of the statements John makes won't make any sense to you without the background. So John says, 1 John 2, 22, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the, what, Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And that statement is a statement directly aimed at who? Serenthus and Serenthianism, which is an outworking of Gnostic dualism. Gnostic dualism also took the form of what is called docetism. Docetism comes from the Greek verb dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. And docetists basically taught that Jesus really didn't have a body. It looked like he had a body. It seemed or appeared like he had a body. But we all know he didn't have a body. Because how could God have a body? Because the physical world is what? Is bad. And this is why 1 John 4, 2 and 3 says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus, uh, confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the who? The Antichrist. So John in his little book says Serenthus is an Antichrist, a baby Antichrist. And so is the docetists. Uh, the docetists and Serenthianism is, is an outworking of Gnostic dualism. And this Gnostic dualism was very prominent in the Mediterranean world. And this is why when you read par Paul's speech on Mars Hill to the pagan philosophers uh, in Greece, and I've actually been there uh, and stood where, well, they didn't have an X that said Paul stood here, but the general area uh, where Paul gave this speech. Paul made this speech to unbelievers, and, and it says this at the end of the speech, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, because Paul concludes everything by talking about Jesus rose from the dead. It says some began to sneer. Well, why would they sneer? Because they've already bought into Gnostic dualism, which says that the physical world is evil. And this mindset, Greece is not very far from Corinth, they're, they're neighbors basically. This mindset goes right into the Corinthian church uh, in the first century. And that's why these guys in Corinth, although they're saved, they start to second guess resurrection. So Paul has to spend a whole chapter straightening these folks out. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12, Paul says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? How could a Christian church get to the point where they're denying resurrection? Because they bought into Gnostic dualism, which says that the physical world is evil. And consequently, Gnostic dualism gets a, it's, gets a stronghold in Alexandria, Egypt, and so in Alexandria, Egypt, they start to deny something that Antioch stood for. Antioch was Kiliast, or premillennial. They believed in an earthly uh, kingdom, which was yet future. And in Alexandria, Egypt, they start to deny that reality. How could there be a physical kingdom of God on the earth one day, because we know that the physical world is what? Evil. And what starts to develop in Alexandria, Egypt, is a doctrine called amillennialism. The A prefix is a negation. Millennium, as we explained last time, is the Latin word that means a thousand years. And they say there is no thousand year kingdom. You know why? Because we're in the kingdom now. Well, what do you do then with all the prophecies that uh, teach a future kingdom of Christ on the earth? You just run those through the grid of allegorization. 
And as you study the kingdom of Christ, uh, it's very clear that it's physical. And there's actually going to be eating and drinking in that kingdom. Did you know that? Matthew 8, 11, Jesus says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table. What do you do at the table? You eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Luke 13, 29 says the same thing. Jesus says they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And Jesus, just prior to his death, said this about the kingdom. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it. That's a physical experience, isn't it? I will drink it with you. Where? In my Father's kingdom. Now, in Alexandria, Egypt, they said, well, that can't be. Like, there can't be a physical kingdom, like is described here, literally, because we know that the physical world is evil. So, Ronald Showers uh, brings this point to our attention. He says, the factor in his change of view was the influence of Greek philosophy upon his thinking. Before his conversion, Augustine was deeply immersed in the study of philosophy of which asserted the inherent evil of the physical and the material world and the inherent goodness of the totally spiritual. Before Augustine even got saved, uh, Augustine became influenced by Gnostic dualism. This philosophy continued to leave its mark upon him after his conversion. Let me read that sentence again. This philosophy continued to leave its mark upon him after his conversion. A lot of people think that once you get saved, the old baggage just disappears. Because the old has become new, and positionally that's true. But here's the reality of the situation. You get saved, especially later in life, you're dragging your bad way of thinking with you into your new Christian experience. And that's why Paul commands us in Romans 12 and verse 2 to do what with our minds? Renew them. The mind thinks like this. God says, no, I want it to think differently. I want to do some recalibrating. Augustine, a brilliant man, never went through that change. And it prompted him to reject as carnal the premillennial idea of an earthly political kingdom of God with great material blessings. He believed that in order for the kingdom of God to be good, it must be what? Spiritual in nature or non-physical. And thus what you see starting in Alexandria, Egypt, is a terrible doctrine called amillennialism. Now this is a citation from Augustine's own book. Uh, He wrote a book called The City of God in the 4th Century, which is your first formal treatment of amillennialism in church history. And Augustine says this, And this opinion would not be objectionable if it were believed that the joys of the saints in the Sabbath shall be spiritual and consequent on the presence of God For I myself, referring to what Antioch taught and Kiliasm and premillennialism, for I myself once held to this opinion. But what won in Augustine's mind? Not the Bible, his Gnostic dualism. Look at what I've underlined here. But as they assert, those who then rise again shall enjoy the leisure of immoderate and carnal banquets... You notice that anything physical he calls carnal. Anything physical he calls bad. So what is he being influenced by here? Not the Bible. Uh, Dualism, Gnostic dualism. Furnished with an amount of meat and drink. Gosh, you can't have meat and drink in the kingdom, even though Jesus said they would be sitting at the table and drinking together. Furnished with an amount of meat and drink such, such as not only to shock the feeling of the temperate, but even to surpass the measure of credulity itself, such assertions can be believed only by the carnal. 
they who believe them are called by the spiritual kiliasts, which we may literally reproduce by the name millenarianism. So what he is saying is Antioch with its kiliasm and millenarianism is wrong. There can't be an earthly kingdom because the physical world is evil. Another major influence on the church that shifted it from Antioch to Alexandria is the decline of the Jewish population in the church. Um, there are no Gentile believers in the church until the conversion of a man in Acts 10. Anybody know who that is? Cornelius. Once Cornelius gets saved, Acts 10, you've got your first Gentile convert. And by the time Paul launches his missionary journeys outside of the land of Israel from Antioch, you start to see a pattern. Everywhere Paul goes, the Jews, the Hebrews, with very few exceptions, are rejecting the gospel. The people that are embracing the gospel are the Gentiles. And the first place this occurs is in Paul's first missionary journey to southern Galatia. And it says this in Acts 13, verse 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. So everywhere Paul goes, he goes to the synagogue first and he almost gets thrown out of the synagogue because they reject his message. And in many cases, he literally gets thrown out of the synagogue. Then he turns to the Gentiles and the Gentiles start getting saved like crazy. So when I gave my uh, test to my students on Acts, and if I, I say, what happened in this and this a city in Paul's missionary journeys, just say this and you'll get the answer right. Paul went to the, Gentile, uh, the Jews, the message is rejected. He turned to the Gentiles, the message is received. Because that happens almost everywhere Paul goes. So in Acts 13, verse 48, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. What the Jews were jealous of, the Gentiles are rejoicing in. And they get, began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as has, had been appointed to eternal life believed. So what starts to happen with the first missionary journey is the ethnic population of the church changes. You move away from an entity that is almost all Hebrew or almost all Jewish to an entity which the Hebrews become the minority and the Gentiles become the majority. And here we are in 2017 in Sugarland, Texas, and we see the same thing, right? We do have a few Hebrew Christians here at Sugarland Bible Church, but that's not the majority. The majority are Gentiles. And this gets so bad in, in terms of a switchover that Paul in Romans 11, verses 17 through 21, has to straighten these Gentiles out because these Gentiles are becoming derisive or arrogant towards the, he the Hebrews who are in unbelief. So Paul uses this example of an olive tree and he talks about the natural branches being taken out of the olive tree. That would be the Hebrews or the Jews in unbelief. And then he talks about these wild olive branches coming in. Uh, they're not even olive branches. They're unnatural branches coming into an olive tree. So who would those unnatural branches be? Gentile Christians. And Paul has to explain in Romans 11, verse 18, that you Gentiles do not be arrogant towards the natural branches, the Jews that have been cut out of the tree. For this simple reason, if God can bring into a tree wild branches that don't belong, which is you, how hard do you think it is for God one day to reach out his hand and take the natural branches, the Jews, and bring them back into their own tree? And Paul explains in Romans 11 uh, that that's, in fact, 
following the rapture of the church, that's exactly what God is going to do. But what I want you to see is the Gentiles, because of the ethnic changeover in the church, were becoming very arrogant towards the Jews. So my point is, uh, Augustinian, Alexandrian thinking would have never taken over the church if the composition of the church remained Jewish. Why is that? Because Jews from birth are steeped in the Old Testament. They love the Old Testament. They interpret the Old Testament literally. So if you had taught there uh, before Paul's first missionary journey the doctrine of amillennialism, you would have been laughed right out of the, the church. But things are different now with the Gentiles becoming predominant because Gentiles, what do they know about the Old Testament? Almost nothing. Uh, they've, they had no training in the Old Testament. They have no training in Hebrew. So when somebody with the gift of gab sort of stands up and says, all of those prophecies are just spiritual, the, the dumb Gentiles, for lack of a better expression, say, you know, that sounds good. That sounds spiritual. And I like the way he talks. And he gave me my liver quiver of the day. Uh, he's got the gift of gab, which are the three things you need for success in ministry, the three Gs, right? You need good looks, you need the gift of gab, and you need a guitar. You got those three things, you're going to go far in ministry. And so the Gentiles who don't know anything about the Old Testament just gravitate around a fine-sounding orator who sounds a lot like the Greek philosophers and orators that they already knew, and so amillennialism, spiritualizing, all of this sounds really good. A Hebrew audience would have never bought into that. So I think the, the shift ethnically from Hebrew to Gentile in Christianity paved the way for uh, amillennialism, Gnosticism, human philosophy, allegorization. And there's one other thing that happened that caused the shift, and it was Constantine's Edict of Milan, which was where this edict was formally made, in A.D. Uh, 313. What, what's the deal with Constantine, a Roman emperor, and the Edict of Milan? Constantine came on the scene and he said, you know, all this persecution of Christianity that we've had for all these centuries, last couple centuries, that's all over. No, no more uh, is there going to be a formal Roman persecution against Christians. And beyond that, we're going to make Christianity the formal religion of Rome. Now, I want you to understand something. Christianity going back to Nero around A.D. 64, which is a good couple hundred years or more earlier, which is almost as long, think about this, as the United States of America has been in existence. It's a long time. Ever since the days of Nero, Christians were uh, persecuted formally by Rome. And this is where the Colosseums, you know, come from, where Christians were, you know, thrown to uh, uh, starving animals to the delight of the masses. And Nero, basically, you know, he would look at his garden parties and say, you know, we need a little light around here. The sun's going down. Oh, here's what we're going to do. Let's take a Christian over there and let's light him on fire. And that'll be kind of our Christmas tree light or whatever that will illuminate our garden party. And this is how Christians are treated from A.D. 64, roughly, all the way to 313. And then all of a sudden, this guy Constantine gets on the throne of Rome, and he says, that's over. And not only is it over, this uh, empire-wide persecution, but Christianity is now going to be elevated. So with the stroke of a pen, Christianity, with the Edict of Milan, goes from per being persecuted to being promoted. Now, what would you think if you were a Christian living in that change, in that transition? You would think the kingdom is here, wouldn't you? 
uh, that would be a, a logical thought. All of the prophecies of Revelation 20 are being fulfilled now. Because Revelation 20, doesn't it say that they're going to reign and rule with Christ? Well, that's happening right now. So the politics of the day uh, created the right spiritual climate for allegorization and amillennialism to just take off like a rocket. And this is why the church goes under an allegorical spell for over a thousand years, which is an awful long time, isn't it? Renald Showers puts it this way. The new view became known as amillennialism. Several things prompted this change in Augustine. First, the political situation in the church, in the Roman Empire, had changed radically around that period in his life. By the time of Roman persecution, uh, by, by that time, the Roman persecution of the church had stopped, and the state made itself the servant of the church. I mean, we can't even get the state to be the servant of the church here in the United States, can we? But that's what happened in Rome. As the Roman Empire crumbled, the church stood fast, ready to rule in the place of the empire. It looked as if Gentile world dominion was being crushed and that the church was becoming victorious over it. Under these circumstances, Augustine concluded that premillennialism, that's the chiliasm that was taught by Antioch, was obsolete and that it did not fit the current situation. In the place of it, he developed the idea that the church is the kingdom of the Messiah foretold in the scriptures as Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Revelation 20 uh, state. In his book, The City of God, he became the first person to teach the idea that the organized Catholic or universal church is the promised messianic kingdom. And the millennium began with Christ's first coming. Augustine's ideas would have never really taken a foothold uh, prior to Constantine. But with, once Constantine comes to the throne, the things that Augustine and those in Alexandria, Egypt were saying become very palatable. So what shifted and caused the church to reject 200 years of tradition taught by Antioch and the, emanating from the apostles? Why in the world would they shift? There's some reasons for it. Number one, the Bible teachers wanted to be relevant. Number two, the church fell in love with human philosophy and incorporated that into its interpretation of Scripture. They, they did the very thing Paul said don't do. Number three, Gnostic dualism uh, began to dominate, and you can't have a physical kingdom of God on the earth because the physical world is evil, and that's where the doctrine of amillennialism comes from, and it tampered other doctrines related to the incarnation. Number four, you have a decline of the church's Jewish population, a Hebrew audience would have never bought into this, but a Gentile, uneducated audience in the Old Testament what began to bought into it. And finally, it fit the politics of the day. Because Constantine elevated Christianity and reversed a trend of persecution. And so consequently, the whole church shifts. Now... I'm not going to go any further than this because I'm out of time, but next week I want to show you two key men who orchestrated this change. One is named Origen, made a few references to him out of Alexandria, Egypt, and another is Augustine. Augustine is the most influential theologian in church history. And when I use the word influential, I'm not using the word influential for good, although he did do some good things, but influential for bad. Because he took uh, the amillennial doctrine and systematized it in his book, The City of God. So by the time The City of God is written, the church now has its first 
formal published treatise defending amillennialism, and amillennialism just takes off. Allegorization takes off, and you know what that led to? The third part in our outline, the Dark Ages, which lasted over a thousand years. There's always faithful remnants throughout the Dark Ages. God always has faithful people, but it wasn't the majority opinion. So by the time the Spirit of God gets his hand on Martin Luther and the Reformers, what they're doing is they're pulling us out of the Dark Ages. And unless, and a lot of them, like John Huss, were burned at the stake for trying to do it. And same with William Tyndale. And uh, th see, you can't appreciate what God did through these uh, Protestant reformers until you see what the devil did to destroy the doctrine of the church. And so that's sort of the direction we're going. So I'll take you into uh, Origen and Augustine next week, and I'll get into uh, a time period called the, the Dark Ages. So, 1045, I stopped on time. See, I'm Antiochian in my beliefs in literal interpretation. 1045 means 1045, right? Well, I guess uh, if, if anybody has a fast question, we could try to answer that. Yeah, Tina?